Let's talk a little bit about what's going on under the hood with that example we just ran of the histogram of ratings from movie ratings data. Good thing to understand what's actually happening under the hood, not just for academic reasons, but also because you want to make sure that you're structuring your Spark scripts in such a way that they will perform in an optimal manner. And having some idea of what's going on underneath the hood can help you do that. And we'll see as we get into more complicated examples later on how we can apply this knowledge. So let's take a look at that little um, ratings counter example that we ran in the previous lecture. So what actually happened when we called count by value on that RDD? That was kind of the last step in our script and it actually was an action on an RDD which caused Spark to go back and actually figure out an execution plan for how to actually get the results we asked for. So what happens there? Well, it keeps track of all the things that we've chained together from different RDDs and how they connect to each other. And based on that information, it constructs a directed acyclic graph. In this case, it might be a very simple one that looks a little bit like this. Basically, we start with a text file command that imports a bunch of raw data into an RDD. We then map that RDD to parse out the information that we care about, which is just the ratings themselves. And then finally, we call the count by value action to total up all the different numbers of each rating type. So that's the execution plan. And you can see here a little representation of how that gets manifested. So we have, in this example, five different lines of ratings data. And these get piped down where they are mapped to just extract the actual ratings themselves. And finally, we add them all up together. Now, an important thing to realize here is that with math, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between each input and each output row of the RDDs. So we can actually keep everything partitioned in the same manner at that step, right? Because these are all just a bunch of parallel lines. We're just taking a bunch of data and transforming it. So that can all happen very easily in a distributed manner. But what happens when we call count by value? Well, we might have to shuffle things around here, okay? So this is where things get a little bit more complicated. You know, in this case, we have a couple of these different rows here getting combined together into that final result. And these two ones kind of like have to get moved around to this final result too. So this is what we call a shuffle operation in Spark, and that can actually cause Spark to have to push a bunch of data around on your cluster, and that can be a very expensive operation. So a lot of times when you're optimizing Spark jobs, you want to be thinking about how can I minimize shuffle operations, and how can I make sure things remain parallelizable when I'm mapping things. So once it has that execution plan, that's basically what Spark does. It looks for places where you need to shuffle data, and uses those as ways to delineate stages, okay? So what happens is Spark will then break this job up into, say, two stages, where the first stage is that text file where we read in the data and then we map it just to extract the data we need. That can all be run together in parallel, okay, as one stage. But then on this count by value command, things need to get shuffled, so that needs to be handled as a second, second stage, okay? So these stages are created based on chunks of processing that can be done in a parallel manner without shuffling things around again. Okay, And when you actually run a Spark job, it will give you in the output, if it's actually being distributed, indications of what stage it's running. And that's what it's talking about. And then, once we have our stages, it will then split those stages up into tasks. So this is where things actually get distributed. Now notice that we have these sort of parallel processing, parallel lines of transformations going on here. Maybe it will break up these two on one node of your cluster and these two into another node of the cluster and this one onto yet another one. So the tasks just break up parallelizable uh, tasks, if you will, for lack of a better word, into discrete pieces that can be processed individually and in parallel. Okay, makes sense? So we start with an execution plan. The execution plan is broken into stages based on things that can be processed together in parallel that don't have a shuffle involved. And then stages get broken up into tasks that are distributed to individual nodes on your cluster. Okay, that's all there is to it. And then it just goes and does it. So it's up to your uh, cluster manager at that point to actually get the data where it needs to be and collect it all back to where it needs to be in the end in your driver script. And the machine starts a running and you get back your results. So at a high level, that is how Spark works internally. And it's just good to understand that again when we're trying to optimize things later on. We'll be talking about things like explicitly partitioning your data and trying to structure things in a way that reduces the amount of shuffles. So keep that in mind. All right, let's uh, move on to another real world example next.